my understanding when you first get here is that I was the first out lesbian or gay faculty member on campus. And that was in 1992, so that wasn't that long ago. Anyway, I was asked to interview what my husband did for a job, and so I came out then. Do you want a funny story? When you first get here as a new faculty member on campus, there's all these things you have to do. And so I was in my office, and I noticed this woman called. I was expecting, you know, a health insurance phone call, something like that. And so I called her back, and I could hear her. She was working on a keyboard, clicking away, and I said, you know, this is Kathy Connolly returning a phone call. And she said, oh, it's you. And I thought, this is bizarre. And she said, I hear, I hear, I hear you're gay. I hear you are. And I was like, uh-huh. And she was like, I hear you came as a couple. I'm one too. Not a couple, just a person. And so she was a kind of lesbian who knew I was coming. And she wanted to come over and meet me immediately. And later she told me there were other lesbians who she knew who wouldn't be seen with me. That I would irreparably taint them. That just to be seen with me could be a problem. I must tell you that when I first heard that you were thinking of coming here, when you first called me, I wanted to say that you just kicked me in the stomach. Why are you doing this to me? But then I thought, that's stupid. You're not doing this to me. And more importantly, I thought about it and decided that we've had so much negative closure on this whole thing. The students really need to talk. When this happened, they started talking about it. And then the media descended and all dialogue stopped. You know, I really love my students because they're free thinkers. And you may not like their opinions because they can be very redneck, but they're honest and they're truthful. So there's an excitement here. There's a dynamic here with my students that I never had when I was in the Midwest or in North Dakota because there was so much Puritanism happening that a lot of the times you didn't have an opinion. And quite honestly, I'd rather have opinions that I don't like and have that dynamic in education. There's a student I think you should talk to. His name is Jediah Schultz. I responded to the call. The first, at first, the only thing I could see was partially somebody's feet and I got out of my vehicle and raced over. I seen what happened to be a young man about 13, 14 years old because he was so tiny, lying there tied to the bottom end of a pole. I did the best I could. The gentleman that was lying on the ground, Matthew Shepard. His head was covered in dry blood and there was dry blood underneath him. He was barely breathing. He was doing the best he could. I was going to breathe for him, but I couldn't get his mouth open. His mouth wouldn't open for me. He was covered in, like I said, partially dry blood and blood all over his face. The only place where he didn't have blood was what appeared to be where he had been crying down his face. His head was distorted, you know. Um, it did not look normal. It looked as if he had a real harsh head wound. Um, he was tied to the fence, about four inches up off the ground. Uh, his hands were thumbs out in what we call a cuffing position. He was tied extremely tight, so I used my boot knife and tried to slip it in between his wrists and the rope. I had to be extremely careful not to harm Matthew any further.
first person we talked to was Matt Mickelson, the owner. My great great grandfather moved here in 1862. He owned Naomi's first opera house. It was called Old Group Front. And in 1870, Lois Grandma Swing cast the first woman ball in any free election in the world. And that's why Wyoming is an equal state. So what I want is to do is establish bar old blue front, opera house, good time apartment. You know, I want a restaurant. I want a gift shop. I want a pool hall. And all do, do all that shit. You know, every night, late. So the farther side is the first step towards the old blue front, opera house, good time apartment. that happen. I lost it on national television, but, you know, we had been up for 72 hours straight and gone home and gone to bed and had to get up and come in. And maybe I was just way... I don't know. But in a moment of complete brain deadness, while I was out there reading that statement, I thought about my own four daughters. Naomi, the two kids. <laughs> and oh, she doesn't have her kid anymore. And here I am, and I'm thinking, this is so lame. Um, and then we started to get to hear some of those emails and letters, and most of them were just generally very funny. <sighs> but I did get this one. <laughs> This guy wrote me and said, do you cry like a baby on TV for all of your patients or just the fat ones? And as I told you before, homosexuality is not a lifestyle with which I agree. Um, but having been thrown into this, I guess I can understand the magnitude with which I'm told to hate. And of all the letters that we got, there were maybe two or three that were like that. Most of them were, thank you for your caring and compassion. And Matthew had caring and compassion from the moment he got here. My son Matthew did not look like a winner. He was rather uncoordinated and wore braces from age 13 until the day he died. However, in his all too brief life, he proved that he was a winner. On October 6, 1998, he proved, he tried to prove that he could win again. On October 12, 1998, my firstborn son and hero died. On October 12, 1998, my firstborn son and hero lost. 50 days before his 22nd birthday. I keep wondering the same thing I first did when I saw him in the hospital. What would he have become? How could he have taken his piece of the world and made it better? Matt officially died in a hospital in Fort Collins, Colorado. He actually died on the outskirts of Laramie, tied to a fence. You, Mr. McKinney, with your friend, Mr. Henderson, left him there. But he was not alone. He had his lifelong friends with him, friends that he had grown up with. You're probably wondering who these friends were. First, uh, he had the beautiful night sky with the same moon and stars we used to see through a telescope. Then he had the sun and the daylight to shine down on him. And through it all, he had the smell of the pine trees on the snowy trail. He heard the wind, the ever-present Wyoming wind for the last time. And he had one more friend with him. He had God. And I feel better knowing that he wasn't alone. The 
asthma, feeding, hospitalization, and funeral. Focus worldwide on hate. Good is coming out of evil. People have finally said, enough is enough. I miss my son, but I'm proud to be able to say that he was my son. Judy has been quoted as being against the death penalty. It has been said that Matt was also against the death penalty. Both of these statements are wrong. Matt believed that there were crimes that justified the death penalty. I would like nothing more than to see you die, Mr. McKinney. However, it's time to begin the healing process. And to show mercy to someone who refused to show any mercy. I'm going to grant you life, Mr. McKinney, as hard as that is for me to do so because of Matthew. Every time you celebrate a Christmas, a birthday, 4th of July, remember that Matt isn't. Every time you wake up in your prison cell, remember that you had the opportunity and the ability to stop your actions that night. You robbed me of something very precious, and I will never forgive you for that. May you live a long life, and may you thank Matt every day for it. Well, I, uh, I took off on my bicycle uh, around 5 o'clock p.m. on Wednesday for my dorm. I just kind of felt like going for a ride. So I, I went up to the top of Cactus Canyon and I'm not super familiar with the area. So on my way back down, I was just sort of picking a way to go, which now makes me think that God wanted me to find him because there was no way I was going to go that way. So I was in some deep ass sand and I wanted to turn around, but for some reason I kept going. So I, I went along and there was this rock on the, on the ground and I just drilled it. I went over the handlebars and I ended up on the ground. So I, I got up. I was just kind of dusting myself off. I was looking around when I, I, I noticed something, which ended up to be mad. He was just lying in there by a fence. I thought it was a scarecrow. I was like, Halloween's coming up. Thought it was a Halloween gag. So I didn't think much of it. I, I got my bike, walked it around the fence that was there. It was a, a bug type fence. And I got a closer look at him. And I, I, I noticed his hair. And that was a major key to me. Noticing it was a human being. Was, was his hair. So I, I just thought it was a dummy, seriously. I even noticed, I, I noticed the chest going up and down and I, I still thought it was a dummy. Thought it was like, some kind of mechanism, but right? 
when I saw hair. Well, I, I knew he was a human being. So, I, I ran to the nearest house. I just ran as fast as I could. And called the police. It was Matthew Shepard, and he said, can you pick me up at the corner of 3rd and Grand? So anyway, I pull up to the corner to see who? Matthew Shepard, you know? It's a little guy about 5'2", soaking wet. I bet you 97 pounds tops. They say he weighed 110, but I wouldn't believe him. They also said he was 5'5 five five in newspapers. But this man, he was only 5'2", maybe 5'1". So he walks up to the window. I'm going to try and go in steps so you better understand the principle of this man. So he walks up to the window and I asked, are you Matthew Shepard? And he says, yeah, I'm Matthew Shepard, but I don't want you to call me Matthew or Mr. Shepard. I don't want you to call you. I don't want you to call me anything. My name is Matt and I want you to know I am gay and we're going to go to a gay bar. Do you have any problem with that? And I said, how you pay him? The fact is Laramie doesn't have any gay bars. And for that matter, neither does Wyoming. So he was asking me to take him down to Fort Collins, Colorado, about an hour away. Matt was a blunt little shit. You know what I'm saying? He always was. But I liked him because he was straightforward. You see what I'm saying? Maybe gay, but straightforward. You see what I'm saying? But it will be everything. Factual. Usual time, Tuesday nights. 10.30, Matthew Shepard shows up. Alone. Sits down. Orders a Heineken. So, what can I tell you about Matt? If you had a hundred customers like him, it'd be the, the most perfect bar I've ever been in. Okay? And nothing to do with sexual orientation. Um, absolute mannerisms. Manners. Politeness. Intelligence. Taking care of me is in tips. Uh, everything. Dress nice, clean cut. Some people you just know. Walks in, please, thank you. Offers intellect, you know, within the vocabulary. Um, so he kicks it there. Didn't seem to have any worries or like he was looking for anyone. Just enjoy his drink and the company around. Approximately 11.45, 11.45. 11.45, Aaron McKinney and Russell Henderson come in. Now, I didn't know their names then, but they're the accused. They're first. They're the accused. They walk in just very stone-faced, you know. Dirty, grungy, rude, give me. That type of thing. They walk up to the bar, uh, and as you know, pay for a pitcher with diamond and quarters. Uh, which I mean is something that you don't forget. You don't forget that. 550 in dimes and quarters. That's a freaking nightmare. Now Anderson and McKinney, they didn't seem intoxicated at all. They came in, they just ordered their beer, took the pitcher with them back into the pool room and kept to themselves. Next thing I knew, probably half an hour later, they were kind of milling around. No beer. And I remember thinking to myself that I'm not going to ask them if they want another one, because obviously they just paid for a pitcher with dimes and quarters. I have a real good feeling they don't have any more money left. I've lived in Wyoming my whole life. The family has been in Wyoming, well, for generations. Now, when it came time to go to college, my parents can't, couldn't afford to send me to college. I wanted to study theater, and I knew that if I was going to go to college, I was going to have to get on a scholarship. And so uh, they have this competition each year, this Wyoming State High School competition. 
and I knew that if I didn't take first place in a duet, that I wasn't going to get a scholarship. So I went to the theater department of the university looking for good scenes, and I asked one of the professors, I was like, I need, I need a killer scene. And he was like, here you go, this is it. And it was from Angels in America. So I read it, and I knew that I could win best scene if I did good enough job. And when the time came, I told my mom and dad so that they would come to the competition. Now, you have to understand, my parents go to everything, every ball game, every hockey game, everything I've ever done. And they brought me into their room and told me that if I did that scene, that they would not come to see me in the competition. Because they believe that it's wrong. That homosexuality is wrong. They felt that strongly about it that they didn't want to come see their son do probably the most important thing he's ever done to that point in his life. And I didn't know what to do. I had never, ever gone against my parents' wishes. I was kind of worried about it. But I decided to do it. All I can remember about the competition is that when we were done, me and my scene partner, we came up to each other, we shook hands, and there was a standing ovation. Oh man, it was amazing! And we took first place, and we won. And that's how come I can afford to be here at the university. Because of that scene. It was one of the best moments of my life. And my parents weren't there. And to this day, that is the one thing my parents didn't see me do. And thinking back, I think, why did I do it? Why did I oppose my parents? Because I'm not gay. So why did I do it? And I guess the only honest answer I can give is that, well, <laughs> I wanted to win. It was such a good scene. It was like the best scene. After seeing Fred Phelps at Matthew's funeral and finding out that he was coming to Laramie for the trial of Russell Henderson, I decided that someone needed to go toe to toe with this guy and show the differences. And I think at times like these, when we're all talking about hatred as much as the nation is right now, that someone needed to show that there is a better way of dealing with that kind of hatred. So our idea is to dress up like angels. And so we have designed an angel outfit for our wings are huge. They're like big ass wings. And there'll be 10 to 20 of us that are all angels. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna encircle Phelps and because of our big wings, we're gonna completely block him. So this big ass band of angels comes in and we don't say one word. We all just turn our backs to him and we stand there. And we were a big group of people coming forward with a message of peace and love and compassion. And we're calling it angel action. Yeah. This 21-year-old little lesbian is ready to walk the line with him. And I knew that my angels were going to be taking the brunt of everything he had to yell. And I mean, we're going to be blocking his view, and he was going to be, like, pissed off to all hell. So I went out, and I bought my angels earplugs. We never really call them Matthew, actually. Most of the time we call them Choo Choo, you know, because we used to call them Matthew and then we just call them Choo Choo. And whenever I think of Matthew, I always think of his incredible beaming smile. I mean, he'll just walk in and he'll be like, you know, he always made you feel great. And he would like scare people down in a coffee shop because he always wanted to sit on the end seat so he could talk to me while I was working. And if someone was sitting in that seat, he would just sit there and stare at them until they left and then he would claim his spot. But Matthew definitely had a political side to him. I mean, he really wanted to get into political affairs. That's all his big interest was, was watching CNN and MSNBC. He was, that's the only TV station I ever saw his TV tune into. 
He was just really smart in political affairs, but not too smart in like common sense things. So he used to allow me to go to school.